Já se encontram à mesa o senhor Richard Palmer, que é chefe de departamento e professor de engenharia civil e ambiental na University of Massachusetts. Um, it's my great pleasure to be here today. Um, it's, uh, there are many people I'd like to thank before I get started, um, including Professor uh, Barbosa and Professor Zufo and Stephanie for helping us to arrive here. Um, we really appreciate that. I want to thank the organizers of the symposium who put together wonderful speakers, a large number of very knowledgeable experts, um, and it's quite an honor to speak directly um, after the president of the National Water Agency. So we really appreciate that. Um, I also want to thank one of the speakers from yesterday, uh, Professor Tendusi, to DC, um, for his open letter on water uh, and Sao Paulo. Um, I, I know there's many students in the audience and I would encourage all of them to take the time to read that letter. Uh, it's an excellent piece of work describing the challenges. Um, and a note to the students today, um, the problems that are being discussed are your problems. These are problems that you will have to solve. Um, so please think about uh, the challenges that they provide. Um, that space bar would be great. Okay, so uh, a couple of things, and Stephanie, I'll do this quickly. Um, I, I wanna thank Stephanie for uh, speaking in Portuguese, and I have to apologize um, for not being able to do that. Um, I, um, also know that there'll be much to learn from you today as time goes on. Um, and again, I want to thank the translators. Uh, it's been wonderful this morning to hear the, the other talks translated expertly. Um, and I want to say that if there are students here who are interested in the work that we're doing, I will be back um, in July and August for two months this year and back in July and August the following year for two months. And so we were lucky to get a Fulbright scholarship to be able to spend time here at Unicamp. So if people are interested in this work, uh, I'll be here to discuss it with them at a later date. Let's go ahead. So um, as Stephanie said, we really have a very, very simple message today. And our simple message is that meaningful public involvement can greatly improve planning for droughts. Um, not a difficult concept, not a difficult message. Um, we know in your region there's a very intense drought, and this drought has had large impacts. And what we want to do today is to share our experience uh, in other parts of the world, although this is primarily a U.S. perspective, but we want to share our experience uh, with you on how we've worked with managing droughts in other locations. Um, a couple of other things I want to point out. Um, in other parts of the U.S., people have prepared for droughts. So next slide. And one more hit, I think. So these are, if you look at the, a map of the U.S. and you look at these cities um, along our east coast, New York City, Boston, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., Atlanta in, in Georgia, Dallas, Texas, San Francisco, Portland, Seattle, and Denver. These are locations that Bill Warrick and I have worked to develop drought management plans. They've been worked out through hard work. Go to the next slide. Yeah. They, they've been worked out through a series of negotiated agreements, but in all cases, people in those cities understand when they're in a drought they understand what actions are gonna be taken, and they anticipate what the impacts will be to them. So again, I don't wanna say that this is easy, but I want to say that it's reasonable to expect that the people who manage your water are able to tell you what the impacts are likely to be of their actions. So we're going to talk about a couple of things I want to sort of relate some droughts that are going on in the U.S. to droughts that, that you're suffering through here. And we're going to talk a little bit uh, about participatory planning 
and I'm going to talk about the types of plans that should be developed. I'll talk about droughts as a catalyst. Um, it was wonderful to hear that droughts, everyone agrees that droughts can create action, and that's a well-known fact. Uh, we'll talk about shared vision planning and collaboration, and then Bill will illustrate a virtual drought. Okay, and as Stephanie used the phrase a moment ago, droughts happen. Um, that's a, um, a polite way of putting this. Um, and whether they're here in, in Brazil, next slide, um, are due to lots of other issues, next slide, um, or whether they're in the U.S., these are natural events. It's possible to consider the fact that climate change may increase the frequency of these, but we've had droughts in the past, and we have droughts right now. There are two droughts going on in the U.S. right now, in California and in Texas, and I'll make a couple of comments about their severity. Next slide. You may, may or may not know much about California, but in general, it's a very dry state aside from the mountains. And so they have built a very large infrastructure in California. This is a list of the major reservoirs. Um, they're facing the worst drought that they've had in the last 100 years. And I'm gonna, this is a complicated graph, but I just want to make a couple of points. Population in California has continued to rise, and that is what the black line is going up into the right. Population has grown significantly. That complicated graph also shows the total storage in all the reservoirs in that system. And there's a little arrow that, I, uh, that Stephanie just activated, and that arrow illustrates the sort of the end of construction of major reservoirs in California. And each of those colors represents the storage that's in an individual reservoir, so hang on. So what you will notice is that California has suffered several multi-year droughts. Um, and you can, you can uh, argue about when they begin and when they end, but essentially they've gone through six and 12 year droughts, some very large droughts. And right now California is very, very upset about their current situation. And they are at 50% storage. That's five zero, 50% storage, and they're extremely upset. And so I think this sort of illustrates the fact that they have taken actions much earlier than uh, has happened here. And everyone has, great, thank you, has different perspectives, but that's what's happening in the U.S. right now. So we'll try this. Uh, we will make this work. Okay, we're good, we're good, we're good. This is a picture from California. It might as well be on the Cantareras system. This is a major reservoir four years ago and a major, that same reservoir today. And it looks just like the system that you have had to deal with. One of the things that I think uh, California has done well is try to measure the impacts of droughts, the economic impacts of droughts. And this is very difficult. Um, it takes a lot of data, the things that, that Stephanie talked about. But they, here's an example and basically they're saying just in 2014, the cost to them was about $2 billion in lost revenues in agriculture, in hydropower, and in other areas. Um, we, I'll move ahead. We attempted to find that kind of data for Brazil and Sao Paulo, but we're not able to do that. It, it very well may exist, and I'm just not aware of it. Um, but basically, I think what we see in California and the other droughts uh, in Texas and around the world is that these have very large economic impacts. And the previous speaker spoke to some of the personal impacts that can occur when people lose their jobs and don't have sufficient water. Um, in, uh, in the U.S., probably agriculture and hydropower are the easiest to measure. Uh, you can know what happens in a good year and what happens in a bad year, and you can calculate the difference. But in terms of putting restrictions on water use, it's a much more difficult economic impact to measure, much more challenging. And when you actually essentially cut off supply, that's really a hard thing to measure in terms of the impacts. But we know there are human impacts associated with that. Um, so as we 
talk today about the virtual drought, one of the things that Bill Ware will ask for later is what are the impacts of droughts? And we look forward to your comments uh, about what you think the impacts of droughts are. So because droughts happen, we know they're going to happen. They will happen again. There's no doubt about that. It's very important to plan for them. It's important to have a plan in place before a drought occurs. Uh, it's important to engage people in the process of planning. And what we're going to argue today is you need to practice. Um, if you want to be a great soccer player, you don't go out on the field only on the day of the game. You go and practice. And that's what we're going to suggest that you can do through the use of computer models. So I will skip this. Uh, uh, I'll just make the point that um, Stephanie did that it's easy to forget uh, what needs to be done when it starts raining. And I'll talk about work that Bill and I did uh, many years ago. Uh, Bill was the, the director of the National Drought Study. It was a study funded by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers to, to better train people and to understand how to better manage droughts in the U.S. Um, like all reports, there are many findings. Only 34 findings, Bill. Couldn't you get 40 findings or 50 findings? 34 findings, a lot of findings. We're going to focus on four, not 34. Just four of the findings of that report. So one of the findings of the report were that people needed to prepare a variety of drought plans. And they sort of fall into three categories. There's strategic plans where you're planning for the next drought 20 years from now. You see population growing, you see demands growing. You have to put in place infrastructure so that you can meet those demands. That's a long-term plan, one kind of plan. Second kind of plan, what I would call tactical plan, and I feel like that's sort of where you are at right now. You're trying to work your way through a drought by seeing what actions are appropriate given the situation you find yourself in. But again, it's wonderful if these tactical plans are developed prior to the drought. Good planning is much more challenging when you're in an event than if you are planning prior to the event. That's easy for me to say. Uh, so, um, and the third one is emergency planning. And I've heard uh, it described here as crisis planning. Um, and again, those, those plans often do not have the time to be fully formulated. They don't have the time to get public input. They're, they're difficult. I think of those as when a pipeline breaks or when something that you don't expect to happen happens. I think drought planning should fall into the first two kinds of planning, strategic and tactical. Um, droughts are catalysts for change. That's another point we'll make. Uh, collaboration, uh, these are my four points. Uh, collaboration makes planning more effective, and we'll talk about virtual drought exercises. So again, strategic plans, long-term plans, tactical plans, much shorter. We think of these as what we call contingency plans drought contingency plans, and this was addressed by the previous speaker, um, that, that if you can develop guidelines based on perhaps reservoir storage and actions that are associated with reservoir storage and communicate that to the public, they can see these droughts develop and they can expect what is likely to happen. Um, and then emergency plans like broken pipelines. Okay, droughts ask, act as catalysts for change. Um, change is often good. Um, change should be controlled, <laughs> change should be planned for. So what I would say about this is that droughts have large impacts and um, water is considered essential everywhere in the world now. And when you deny people of what they consider an essential resource, their response is never positive. Uh, I think you can anticipate that. And so if you're going to find yourself in a situation where you need to change the amount of water that you deliver to people, engaging them in the discussion about how those decisions are made is extremely important. Not only is it important to the people, but it's important to the agencies that are involved in the process because they can expect a much higher level of reaction, engagement, and response if people have been involved in that discussion. 
And as I say here, not inviting them invites failure. So let me talk a little bit about um, the process that we've developed over time. Um, during the National Drought Study, um, Bill and I um, were able to do a number of case studies across the U.S. And when I met Bill, one of the things that he told me was it would be fruitless to use computer models to help in the, in the planning process. And I, I think our discussion went something like the following. It was me saying, you should use computer models, and Bill saying, computer models always cost too much money, they always are delivered too late, and they never address the issues that are important. That's pretty damning. I mean, that's a pretty strong statement. And I said to Bill, you must be totally uninformed about modern computers and their ability uh, to engage stakeholders, or something like that. In addition to saying, you're not very smart, you're not very, you're current, something like that to Bill. Um, but the result was he did allow us to begin developing computer models of all the systems that we were looking at. In addition to the fun part of developing computer models, uh, at least some of us think that's the fun part of planning. In addition to that, we developed and built upon established plans for good planning. How do people do good planning? And what we said was in, in the future, good planning will involve collaboration between all the people who will implement the plan and who will be impacted by the plan. It will also involve good planning policies that we've learned from the past, and it will involve being able to model what is likely to happen, that all three of those ingredients will become necessary. So the little symbol in the lower right looks, is an attempt to try to show those three aspects all together, and we called this shared vision planning. In addition, we said there are seven steps you should go through, and we won't spend much time talking about this, but they all involve engagement. So you have to put together teams. And in the case um, here in Brazil, we heard about stakeholders. We heard about, and when I say stakeholders, um, it may be a different, um, Brazil is known for its steaks and meat. Is that right? So stakeholders is not related to that. Um, it's related to anyone who might be impacted by water and, and planning for water. So you put together teams. You would put together teams that represent agriculture that was mentioned. You would put together teams that represent people in municipal uh, water authorities. You would put together teams of people who are interested in the environment and you would make sure they were all involved in whatever plan was development, developed. Then you have to identify your objectives. You have to clearly state what the plan is supposed to do, what you're trying to get from your plan you try to define where you are, and today we know where we are. We have about 14% storage in the reservoirs, at 12%. Um, it does, uh, we won't argue about how much storage there is. We know that the reservoirs are not as high as we'd like for them to be. We have a history of the hydrology, so we sort of know the situation that we're in. So we would look at what would happen if we operated the system normally, what would happen if we operate the system differently, um, and then we'd evaluate those alternatives um, and then develop a great plan and at the very end exercise, meaning test the plan. So um, that's what we mean by shared vision planning and Bill will talk about that. Multiple steps always involve engagement, involves working with people so they understand impacts. And if you're interested, there's, of course, there's a website. There's always a website. Um, if you're interested in this sort of thing, you can take a look. Um, and I'll just say one more thing about virtual droughts before I introduce Bill. So um, the first drought, virtual drought was held before many people in this room were alive. Um, I'll have to put it that way. And it was held on a mainframe computer. There was no such thing as personal computers at the time. Um, and so it was related to the, our nation's capital, Washington, D.C.'s water supply. And we, the, for the, our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., there was a suggestion that 16, 16 
one six new reservoirs be constructed to provide water for the for Washington D.C. And like Stephanie, I was a graduate student at the time at Johns Hopkins University, and I said, 16, that's a lot of reservoirs. Maybe we don't need 16 reservoirs for the nation's capital. Because there are costs associated with reservoirs, not only financial costs, but um, it would be damming some of our most pristine rivers. It, it was a very large project. So um, what we wanted to do was to illustrate that maybe you didn't need 16 reservoirs. So we developed a computer model, we took the managers of that system and set them down, and then we allowed them to play with their current system by changing storages, by adding reservoirs, by not adding reservoirs, but most of all, working together. I really appreciated the comments of the previous speaker associated with the multi-levels of government. It's extremely difficult. But what I would say is that when you take rational people who are responsible for providing water and you show them alternatives that make sense, they gravitate, they move towards those solutions. And in our case, we in Washington, D.C., two reservoirs were built, not 16, uh, only two, um, and that has provided water from Washington, D.C. ever since, and now a common trend in the U.S. is people using less water every year, and now there's ample water for the system. Um, the other thing, the other point I will make very quickly is that this was sort of the start of gaming using computer models, not as fun as some, not nearly as fun as some games, but it gave people who manage water the chance to explore in kind of a co competitive gaming situation, which you'll see today. Okay, so just in closing, uh, we'll do, we'll, Bill will introduce the virtual drought and we'll get your engagement. And I just wanna say a couple of things. The whole point of a virtual drought is to identify system weaknesses and strengths. Um, there may be portions of a system that's very strong uh, very robust, able to deal with changes, but there may be parts of the system that are not. It allows managers to practice decision making in a safe environment. So what I would say, with all due respect, making decisions right now associated with the Canterbury system is not a safe environment. Uh, it gets reviewed, there's, there's so much at stake. There's so much at stake right now in making good decisions. So if you can practice um, in a non-drought situation, that's a, that's a, a, a wonderful opportunity. One of the, another thing that happens when there are multiple institutions that are involved and they get to practice, they can develop trust between one another and they can develop professional allegiances, which is, a, is also a great uh, opportunity. Um, let's see, the, the overall goal is to identify good alternatives and practicing and these virtual droughts allow that. And finally, you try to look at those solutions that are most suitable uh, to put into place. Um, so uh, my last slide, what I will say is that um, when you do this right, when you're able to, to bring stakeholders together, you're able to see what their opinions are about water supply. You're able to understand trade-offs. This will be a great thing that we'll do today is show you trade-offs. What if you deliver less water? What if you deliver more water? Um, and an important thing is that you will be able to define, as the previous speaker addressed, triggers and actions that you can take and can be communicated to people. Um, and again, finally, Bill will get a chance to demonstrate this. So uh, um, I'm going to step away from the podium and uh, hand it over to Bill. But before I stop, let me thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate all the people with headphones on uh, listening to the translation. And again, it was my great pleasure to speak to you today. Thank you.